and he wanted to make sure all the students are aware of that program because coming to this class actually fulfills one of the requirements so we don't make sure everybody gets credit for that if they want to. So yeah, G-P-P-E-S, if you want more information, just search utexas.edu, G-P-P-E-S, that's the fastest way to get it. So it's meant to be uh, something that gives you a broad picture. This is for graduate students at UT, a broad picture of energy sector and, and help equip you to uh, be familiar with the overall policy perspective related to energy and to, to tie in and leverage all the strengths that UT has across all its different colleges engineering, business, law, policy, et cetera, and tie those together and give you the opportunity to, to branch out from perhaps where you are in your own particular program. Um, so it's not an extra degree. It's, it's just a program that's noted on your transcript. It's not meant to be onerous or keep you longer than you normally need to graduate, say, with your master's or PhD. But it is noted on your transcript, hopefully to make you more attractive to employers. Um, you need to be re doing research related to energy. That's the whole idea, Graduate Portfolio Program in Energy Studies. And there are two core courses, one of which is just this seminar for two semesters, and the other one is the Energy Technology and Policy that Dr. Beach teaches one semester and I'm teaching this spring semester. So I won't spend too much more time on it, but just, again, search on GPPES at utexas.edu to find out more. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Uh, tonight we've got a fantastic speaker as usual. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to meet David before tonight, but it's quite a resume he's got here. If anybody knows Saudi Arabia and Saudi Aramco and Aramco, it is him. Uh, he is a UT alum, got his UT law degree here a few years ago, and immediately upon graduating, left. Ran off to New York, got a job in oil and gas, and they immediately sent him overseas. And for his 40-plus year career as an oil and gas lawyer, he spent 35 of it overseas in the Middle East. So if there's anybody who knows this topic, I dare say it's him. He's got a presentation tonight. He's going to talk to us about the past, the present, and the future of Saudi Aramco or Aramco. And he's agreed to join us afterwards for drinks and snacks. If anybody wants to join us to carry on the discussion, we'll probably walk over to the AT&T Center and uh, go to Gabriel's. So if you're interested, please join us afterwards to continue the discussion. Uh, he's like me. I looked. He's got 60-plus slides, and he says he can do it in an hour. Uh, I'm kind of like that. I used to go 90 slides, and I'll go 90 slides in an hour, but it's a staccato pace. But he thinks he can get through it in 60 minutes. We'll have some time for questions, and then we'll move on. So with that, David, the stage is yours. Um, can people in the back hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to talk about a company with which I spent 43 years. Um, I joined Aramco in 1973 out of law school and over uh, that 43 year career I started uh, with a pure E&P exploration production concessionary company, an American company, uh, and concluded that career with what uh, is today the world's largest integrated energy and chemicals company and also the largest national oil company, obviously, in the world. I uh, held the position of general counsel and secretary uh, for the last six years of uh, that career from 2010 to uh, 2016, uh, to uh, September 30th, 2016, and uh, left as a senior vice president and the last uh, non-Saudi in uh, corporate management, which is a reflection of nothing but uh, my age, I think. Um, This is an outline of what I'd like to talk about today, uh, starting with a very few words uh, about Saudi Arabia, its modern history and place in the Islamic uh, world, the creation and development of the Arabian American Oil Company, Aramco, and its evolution over, 55, over uh, about 55 years uh, into uh, the National Oil Company of Saudi Arabia what uh, Saudi Aramco has become today. And then I'll talk uh, a little bit about the serious economic, structural, and social challenges 
faced by the kingdom in today's low price, peak demand uh, world of oil. Those challenges are being met by a uh, young and dynamic, or some might say radical, uh, government in Riyadh, led by a 32-year-old crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, son of the, uh, of the current king. Vision 2030 is the government's strategic plan designed to restructure the economy, uh, liberalize society, and, perform, and uh, reform the government's bureaucracy. And finally, I'll say a few words about the well-publicized Aramco IPO. Uh, the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia was created in 1932 uh, the, as the culmination of an almost 30-year military campaign uh, waged by the first king, Abdulaziz al Saud, and his religiously inspired followers, which was intended to um, unify the largely nomadic tribes on the Arabian Peninsula and to impose uh, the fundamentalist Wahhabi uh, strain of Islam on a largely illiterate population. There are several obvious reasons that Saudi Arabia uh, is important to us here in the United States. Uh, its enormous hydrocarbon resource base and the influence that this gives it in international energy markets, plus the responsible role, I would argue, that it's played over the years uh, within OPEC as the world's swing producer, supporting prices in uh, times of oversupply and filling supply gaps in times of shortage. Its strategic relationship with the United States uh, is also quite important. It goes back to the mid-1940s uh, as an energy supplier and uh, as a counterweight first to Soviet designs in the Arabian Gulf and today uh, Iranian aspirations there. Just a little geography, uh, modern Saudi Arabia encompasses most of the Arabian Peninsula with Red Sea and uh, Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf as we prefer to call it on the Arab side. Um, coastlines, it occupies a strategically important position uh, between um, Africa, Asia and Europe it has borders with Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, the UAE, Oman, and uh, Yemen. Uh, and, and then 100 miles across the uh, Gulf sits Iran. It's the birthplace of Islam, the location of the two holiest sites of the religion, uh, and the destination for millions of uh, pilgrims each year, positioning the kingdom as uh, a leader in the Islamic world. These are rather dynamic and uncertain times in Saudi Arabia. Uh, later in the hour, I want to uh, address recent developments there driven by the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, including the November anti-corruption campaign. The building in the middle of this slide is the probably best appointed jail uh, in the world, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in uh, Riyadh that played host to over 300 uh, notable people, including s some of the people uh, shown on the right side of the, uh, the slide uh, from November, and, and some of them I think are still there. Uh, Saudi Aramco is at the center of many of the things happening uh, in the kingdom today and has been impacted by most all of them. Um, now, the Saudi Arabian oil company, Saudi Aramco, uh, today is in many respects unique uh, among state-owned oil companies or NOCs. Many of its distinguishing characteristics can be traced back through the 55 years that it was an American company, an American concessionaire, and the process that transformed it uh, from a pure ENP concessionaire into the uh, global fully integrated energy and chemicals company that it is today. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was founded, as I said, in 1932. Uh, at that time, there was growing interest in oil exploration in the Gulf as a result of discoveries in Persia, or Iran, 
uh, and later in Iraq, as well as promising exploration results in Bahrain. Uh, while considering how to develop uh, his country's natural resources, uh, King Abdulaziz, the first king, confronted a more immediate uh, issue or problem, a decline in the primary source of his income, which was revenue from the Islamic pilgrimage from the Hajj. Uh, it was uh, during the Great Depression and the numbers of pilgrims coming to the kingdom uh, was declining quite dramatically. He also recognized that he needed foreign capital and technology uh, to develop his new desperately poor country. He played um, Standard of California, which later became Chevron, off against the Anglo-Persian oil company, which later became uh, British Petroleum, um, who were competing for a concession uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the British, because of their interests in Iran and Iraq um, were unwilling to bid competitively against uh, SoCal. Uh, so the concession went to Standard of California, uh, signed in Jidda on uh, May 29, 1933. There's a picture of that event uh, there on the slide. Um, a, a SoCal uh, subsidiary, the California um, uh, Arabian Standard Oil Company, or KSOC, was formed to exploit the concession with its first uh, well being drilled in 1935. In 1936, Texaco was brought in as uh, a partner in the enterprise because of uh, the need for marketing outlets in Asia and Africa, of which uh, Texaco uh, had quite a few, but no um, crude source. Conversely, um, Standard of California had uh, potential oil uh, supply, but no uh, outlets. The first commercial discovery in Saudi Arabia occurred in 1938, about a mile and a half from the house in which I lived for the last 27 years. Um, the first oil was exported from the kingdom in 1939. Uh, operations were suspended during the Second World War. In 1943, KSOC became the Arabian American Oil Company, Aramco. And in 1948, uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, uh, which is now uh, Exxon, and uh, Standard Oil of New York, which uh, was mobile, um, joined the two then current shareholders as owners of Aramco, again, uh, to provide marketing outlets for growing volumes of Saudi crude production. Uh, yes. Uh, a, a small amount, uh, but the production at that point was was not what it is today. Obviously, I would say it was not more than a couple hundred thousand barrels. Um, negotiations for the Saudi government's takeover of uh, Aramco began in 1968 uh, in a climate of resource nationalism. nationalism and uh, government-driven renegotiations of concession terms, and in some countries, uh, outright nationalization. Uh, the, participation, the participation process took uh, over 20 years to complete. The Saudi government ultimately paid book value for the above-ground assets of Aramco, but nothing for the reserves, which, after all, uh, were properties of the state. Um, Saudi Aramco's later success, I think, was facilitated uh, in large part by the professional way uh, in which the negotiations, uh, which I was kind of on the periphery of as a long, young lawyer, uh, were handled um, on both sides. The, uh, the full economic effect of 100 uh, percent government ownership was, to t uh, was in place by 1980, but uh, from 1980 to 1988, uh, the old Aramco, the American company, operated those assets uh, which were beneficially owned by the government uh, on the government's behalf in return for a fee. 
then the legal entity Saudi Aramco was created by a royal decree in 1988, uh, legal title to the assets, um, including Aramco's concessionary rights and privileges, strangely enough, were transferred to Saudi Aramco. Uh, the workforce, including management, uh, went to bed uh, on December 31st, uh, 1988, as employees of an American company and woke up the next morning as employees of uh, a Saudi national oil company. Um, the government did not at that time, nor has it since, ceded its own representatives into Aramco's management. The Aramco American management that was in place in 1988, by and large, uh, worked uh, through to retirement and uh, retired to be taken, whose uh, places were taken by Saudi nationals who had been developed by the company over a number of years uh, to step into management positions. And I think, again, this is one of the, the reasons Aramco, as Saudi Aramco, has been the success that it has been. Uh, from 1990 to 2010, the concession area, which uh, initially uh, under the older Aramco was limited to the eastern part of the country, was expanded to cover the entire uh, country of Saudi Arabia. Overseas marketing offices were established, international refining and marketing investments were made, and the Saudiization of the workforce uh, accelerated over that period of time. Now, in 2010, uh, leaping ahead a little bit, um, the price of OPEC crude, the average price of a barrel of OPEC produced crude, was $77.38. In 2011, 12, and 13, it was well over uh, $100 a barrel. Despite record earnings, uh, Saudi Aramco's management recognized that the kingdom's near total dependence on uh, the oil business and oil revenue um, was unsustainable. Uh, and it presented uh, long-term strategic and economic threats, not only to the kingdom, but uh, obviously to the company. To address those challenges, the company's management uh, worked with McKinsey in 2010 and 2011 to develop a strategic plan for Saudi Aramco uh, in order to position the company to act as an engine of economic growth, uh, economic diversification, and job creation for the kingdom. We chose to call it the Accelerated Transformation Program because of the urgency that we saw in the situation that existed uh, at that period of time. The vision, uh, as stated in the preamble to uh, the ATP document, um, is that in, in by 2020, uh, Saudi Aramco has become the world's leading integrated energy and chemicals company focused on maximizing income, facilitating growth of the kingdom's economy, and enabling a high growth and vibrant uh, Saudi energy sector. Supporting uh, this aspirational goal are a series of corporate objectives to maintain preeminence in oil and gas exploration and production, uh, to create a global scale refining and chemicals business, to enhance uh, the company's organizational agility and performance, achieve a leadership position in R&D, uh, facilitate the creation of an energy efficient economy, and to support creation of an export oriented uh, energy support industry. Um, below these um, goals are a series or uh, to implement these uh, goals to achieve them. Uh, we worked to develop 14 separate uh, implementation strategies uh, which are shown here. Those strategies um, guide the company's investments and uh, operational decisions today. In many ways, this accelerated transformation program um, 
served as a model for the Kingdom's uh, Vision 2030 National Strategic Plan, which is not surprising since they used the same consultants. You read through some of the documents and they sound very, very familiar. Um, Saudi Aramco today is the world's largest integrated oil and gas company uh, as according to Petroleum Intelligence Weekly and a number of other uh, industry publications that are concerned with such things. It's uh, a top three resource holder um, with uh, the largest uh, crude production of around 10 million barrels a day in the world and the fourth largest uh, natural gas producer. Um, it's recognized, I think it's fair to say, as the best run national oil company um, for several reasons. Uh, one, the absence of government interference in its day-to-day uh, -day affairs, which has been the case from 1988 to today. The government's mandate that Saudi Aramco uh, retain and build on the systems and the standards of the old Aramco, uh, which is reflected, uh, in fact, in the company's articles. And uh, the quality and stability of its management, which I have a bi biased view of, um, and its board of directors, which includes, and this is unique, I think, among national oil companies, three Westerners, uh, Sir Mark Moody Stewart, who was the former CEO of uh, Royal Dutch Shell, and chairman of Anglo-American, the mining company, Andrew Gould, the former CEO of Schlumberger and chairman of BG Group, British Gas, and Peter Voika, the former head of the International Finance Corporation, which as you probably know is the sister institution of the World Bank. Uh, it's quite a strong board uh, beyond the Westerners, uh, I might add. Uh, the company has the lowest production costs in the industry. Uh, I think this year they're below three and a half uh, barrels a day. Uh, I'm sorry, three and a half dollars per barrel a day. Uh, and that uh, three and a half barrels, three and a half dollars per barrel, um, covers a lot of uh, costs which are unusual for most oil companies, security costs, uh, health care for the employees and so forth. Um, as part of the ATP, the company is also uh, aggressively expanding its global refining and chemicals business and uh, growing its R&D uh, capabilities. Over the combined history of the two Aramcos, uh, the company has discovered 130, more than 130 oil and gas fields. Only 17 of the oil fields uh, have so far been produced. Uh, the major ones are shown here. Uh, this map is a little easier to, uh, to read. The green are oil fields. The red are non-associated gas fields. Uh, most all of them in the uh, eastern and central part of the uh, country, although there is quite a bit of exploration work going on in the north and western part of the country, and uh, there have been some gas finds there. Uh, there's not been any uh, uh, major oil finds um, yet, although there's exploration going on in the deep uh, part of the Red Sea on the Saudi side of the littoral line. The Gawar field there in the middle is the largest onshore oil field in the world. It uh, started producing back in the 50s and today is still producing 5 million barrels of oil a day, which uh, dwarfs uh, most any other oil field in the world. Uh, Safania up uh, in the north um, along the uh, Kuwaiti and Iranian borders is the largest offshore conventional oil field in the world. It produces about 1.2 million barrels a day. And the company has several other fields that produce from 500,000 to uh, over a million barrels currently.
um, oil production and exports. When I joined Aramco, we were producing about three and a half to four million barrels uh, per day. In 2016, production averaged uh, over 10, about 10 and a half. A couple of things to note from the graph. Uh, the Saudi production decline in the mid-1980s, um, which bottomed out in 1986 with $10 a barrel oil, reflects Saudi efforts within OPEC to support prices playing its role as swing producer. Uh, while production has steadily increased since 1990 or so, um, Exports have remained, which are the green, have remained essentially static. Uh, the increase has all, virtually all been to satisfy, to um, fuel the local domestic market, which is an issue for Aramco because uh, rather than getting uh, international export prices for that oil, it gets about $1.30 a barrel, uh, which doesn't co cover its um, production costs. Um, Saudi Aramco exports 75% of the oil that it uh, produces. In recent years, the destination of that oil has pivoted uh, to Asia and away from the company's traditional markets in North America and Europe. Uh, Today, fully two-thirds of the oil goes to Asia, uh, almost 16% to the U.S., and a little less than 11.5% to Europe. China is the largest customer for Saudi Aramco. It takes about a million barrels, a little over a million barrels a day um, in imports, followed by Japan and South Korea. China, Indonesia, and Malaysia are the focal points of Saudi Aramco's overseas refining investments uh, these days. India and the United States are also uh, to be of, are also uh, understood to be of interest uh, as investment targets. Saudi Aramco has a major um, uh, was a joint venture with Shell before that with Texaco uh, in. Uh, Texas and the Gulf and uh, uh, Atlantic states called Motiva, uh, which broke up last year. And now Aramco owns uh, the greatest part of that, including the Port Arthur refinery, uh, which it will or has plans to expand sometime in the next few years. Uh, the principal objective of these overseas investments is to secure guaranteed outlets for oil production. In chemicals, uh, Saudi Aramco, under the ATP, has aspirations to be among uh, the top three to five chemical producers in the world. The uh, company currently has joint ventures with the Dow Chemical Company, Sumitomo Chemicals uh, of Japan, and Lanxus, which is a German synthetic rubber uh, manufacturer. In November, um, Saudi Aramco and SABIC, which is the Saudi Arabian Basic Industries uh, Corporation, announced uh, plans to build a $20 billion complex in Saudi Arabia to convert um, crude oil directly into chemicals using technologies uh, developed by the two companies over the past few years. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, R&D is a focus of the ATP. Um, the company has two primary R&D centers in its headquarters of Dahran. Uh, it has nine satellite centers, um, eight of them outside of the kingdom, including three in the United States, one in Houston, uh, one in Detroit, and one across the street from MIT in, um, in the Boston area. It also uh, has uh, collaboration programs with a number of leading technical universities around the world. I'm happy to say UT is one of them, Texas A&M is another, and MIT another. 
It operates a $500 million technology-focused corporate equity fund, which invests in technologies uh, in its business focus areas or of interest to its business focus areas. Um, and the research and uh, corporate equity investment funds are spread uh, across the upstream, the downstream, and uh, some cross-business spheres, spheres of uh, operations. Um, now, I'll pivot a little bit uh, to some of the issues facing the kingdom as a whole. Despite uh, Saudi Arabia's enormous oil and gas and other mineral wealth, uh, today it faces at least four serious internal economic, structural, and political challenges, uh, as well as an external strategic uh, threat to its very existence uh, from Iran, or at least it perceives it that way. Uh, the internal challenges are essentially those that drove uh, the creation of Saudi Aramco's ATP in 2011. Uh, the Saudi economy is dependent on a single commodity, oil. Uh, more than 90% of the central government's revenue year to year comes from the sale of crude oil in the form of taxes, royalties, and dividends from Aramco. That's 90%. Uh, government uh, revenue fell from $290 billion in 2014 to around $140 billion in 2016 as a result of the collapse in oil prices that began in the summer of 2014. The kingdom's decision to uh, that year to defend market share against rising U.S. shale production is uh, widely blamed for the price collapse. The price of Brent, shown here, fell from $115 a barrel in June of 2014 to $35 a barrel or so in February 2016. Similarly, WTI fell from $110 a barrel to below $30. The consequences of the price collapse were a 50% reduction in Saudi Aramco's revenue, uh, which translated in a 66% reduction in the government's take, reflected in a parallel decline in government revenue. Uh, and deficits, which totaled $100 billion or so in 2015, $80 billion in 2016, and $62 billion in 2017, which is going in the right direction, but is still, for an economy of that size, quite significant. Uh, as a result, the government has been challenged to meet its obligations, including funding a very generous menu of social services and programs, large public works and infrastructure projects, sorry, um, government to government grants, and the war in Yemen. To meet its obligations, the government has increased energy and feedstock prices, which it controls and has controlled historically. It's introduced a value-added tax. Saudi citizens don't pay any income tax. Um, they've increased fees for government services, primarily uh, ones uh, affecting foreign workers. Uh, they've uh, delayed payments to government contractors. They've borrowed and drawn down uh, foreign currency reserves. And then most recently in November, they began pressure pressuring wealthy individuals, uh, members of the royal family, uh, several Saudi billionaires uh, and several government ministers uh, to return billions of dollars in alleged improper commissions, kickbacks, uh, and uh, proceeds of illicit land sales and so forth. The second um, challenge faced by Saudi Arabia is a rapid uh, increase in its energy consumption. Uh, this is a result of a history of controlled 
uh, energy prices, leading to wasteful consumption and significant opportunity costs to uh, the government. Saudi Arabia is the uh, largest energy consumer in the Middle East. It consumes the greatest amount of uh, oil to uh, generate electricity of uh, any country in the world. Its energy intensity, which is um, energy consumed per unit of GDP, uh, is one of the highest in the world, 4.1 versus the UK's uh, energy intensity rating of, of one, uh, while the, uh, the Western country's energy intensity is declining, which is a good thing, uh, Saudi energy consumption continues to grow. From 2010 to 2015, it grew at 7.5% year on year, which is enormous. In fact, there are uh, studies that show that if they don't do something to curb uh, that trend, that by 2030, uh, Saudi Arabia could be a net importer of energy. Uh, and as I said, the growth in domestic consumption, where uh, energy is sold at very, very low prices, below international market prices, represents an enormous opportunity cost for the kingdom uh, in the range of tens of billions of dollars a year, depending on the price of oil internationally. The uh, third of uh, the issues is an underdeveloped private uh, sector with weak job growth and dependence on uh, public service, public sector projects to fuel the economy. Seventy percent of working Saudis are employed by the government in one way or another. The private sector contributes only about 40 percent to Saudi GDP. Um, the government's efforts to increase foreign direct investment in Saudi Arabia to stimulate the private sector has been disappointing. In fact, over the last five years, it's declined. Um, from 2009 to 2014, you know, which are the only figures I could find uh, at the time I put this together, it was uh, a decline of 78%. Um, Saudi Aramco, through the Accelerated Transformation program has a lot of uh, programs and initiatives directed at uh, stimulating private sector growth and job creation, but it can't do it all uh, alone. And then the fourth of the domestic challenges is a very young population and high unemployment uh, rates within uh, that uh, demographic. Uh, as, apps, as I think amply demonstrated uh, during the Arab Spring, uh, this is a recipe, if it's allowed to continue, for uh, popular discontent and political unrest or worse. Two-thirds of the population in Saudi Arabia is below the age of 30. Uh, acknowledged unemployment, employment that the government uh, chooses to recognize exceeds 11.5%. 29%, though, for those uh, from 16, for males between the ages of 16 and 29 years. Uh, at least that's the estimate. And it's higher, uh, not surprisingly, uh, among females desiring to work. The education system has failed over the years to produce graduates with the right skills. Uh, there is a Boston Consulting Group study that concluded that fully 63% of Saudi um, university graduates graduate with degrees that are, aren't marketable within the local economy. Uh, there's a need to create over 4 million uh, private sector jobs 
uh, over 8 million uh, jobs overall by 2030. And obviously creating more than 650,000 new jobs each year is a major uh, challenge in an economy like this. And then, uh, very briefly, the external threat uh, that the uh, kingdom sees from Iran. Uh, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry uh, has its roots going back many centuries. Uh, it uh, is Arab Sunni Saudi Arabia versus Persian Shia Iran at its, at its essence. The present uh, problems date from the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Uh, it's manfe manifested m most uh, vividly in the proxy war in Yemen, uh, in support for opposing sides in Syria, uh, for Saudi and Ir Iranian uh, intervention in Lebanese politics. Uh, the GCC Saudi-led embargo of Qatar, which uh, Saudi Arabia sees as getting too close to Iran and to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and uh, very strong opposition to the U.S.-Iranian nuclear deal. The, the war in Yemen is a, a very serious drain on Saudi government finances. It uh, costs the government uh, on the order of a billion and a half dollars a month to sustain that war. Uh, the indiscriminate, the allegedly indiscriminate dom uh, bombing and shelling of Yemeni uh, towns and villages uh, has uh, had a very serious and damaging impact on uh, the international reputation of Saudi Arabia. Um, the meddling of both Saudi Arabia and Iran in Lebanon uh, could very well destabilize uh, a, a very tenuous democracy which has borders with both Syria uh, and Israel. And it's also uh, presented or uh, created tensions within OPEC and made it difficult to uh, secure Iranian support for production uh, cutbacks uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, just a few words about uh, the relatively new government in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in uh, January of 2015, King Abdullah was much beloved within the kingdom, I can assure you, uh, passed away. Crown Prince Salman bin Abdulaziz was uh, crowned the king. Salman designated Prince Mugran um, bin Abdulaziz as crown prince. Uh, Mugran had been the deputy crown prince under Abdullah. In April, not four months later, Mugran was removed as crown prince, and uh, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef bin Abdulaziz was made uh, crown prince. Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the king's son, uh, was then named to deputy crown prince. Mohammed bin Nayef uh, lasted until June of 2017 when he was removed as crown prince, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the 32-year-old son of the king, was designated as crown prince. Uh, Mohammed bin Nayef is uh, understood to be under house arrest. He has not been seen since uh, he, to great fanfare and TV cameras, pledged allegiance to the king and to the new crown prince shortly after he was removed from his office. Uh, on November 4th of last year, the government announced the creation of something it referred to as the Supreme Anti-Corruption Committee, headed by Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, that committee was given broad investigative and police powers. Um, literally that same evening, 
a large number of senior princes, current and former ministers, religious uh, authorities, and several uh, Saudi uh, businessmen, including uh, Prince Al Walid bin Talal, who some of you probably have heard of, uh, were arrested and detained uh, at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Uh, the targets of uh, this process represent the three societal pillars on which the stability of the Saudi state has traditionally rested. Um, it's been a lot of speculation as to what this program represents. Is it as the government uh, would uh, like us th to think an anti-corruption crusade? Um, is it a purge of political opponents? Is it a bloodless revolution of some sort? Um, one thing that I can tell you from having been back to Saudi Arabia uh, in November of this past year, shortly after this happened, uh, is that the crackdown on corruption, as it's presented, uh, enjoys wide public support at virtually all levels of Saudi society, at least in age groups, at least among the people that, that I talked to. And I tried to seek people out and, and get a, a reading on this. Uh, in the West, the perspective is a little bit different. Um, if, uh, it's widely viewed by a lot of con commentators as an effort to consolidate uh, Mohammed bin Salman's power as the uh, next king, presumably, uh, to do away, um, not in a physical way, but uh, in a political way, with his political uh, opponents. The problem uh, with the way it's been handled is that it hasn't been done in a transparent uh, way. The government uh, claims that due process has been given to those accused, that uh, they've had access to counsel and so forth, yet it still to this day has not published an, a list of those actually detained, nor uh, disclosed the charges brought against uh, each of them. Uh, a number of, a large number of the detainees have been released, uh, but none of them has chosen to speak publicly about uh, the experience and their view of its motives. Um, it's important, I think, that the situation stabilize uh, before the Saudi Aramco IPO because it's raised a lot of questions in the investment community uh, about the rule of law and uh, the uh, security of investments in the kingdom. Um, because uh, those that have been released and the majority of the 380 or so uh, folks that were detained have been released. Um, they've uh, all been released, it's been reported by the eternal Attorney General, in return for repayment of uh, money and assets to the corporate to the uh, uh, national treasury in excess of 105 billion dollars, I think, at last count, uh, out of the pockets of say 300 uh, individuals, including uh, interests in their companies and. Uh, real estate, and so forth. And in return for that, uh, each of them uh, has been granted a pardon, although there, since there weren't actual uh, charges or a legal process, characterizing it as a pardon is uh, somewhat ironic. Um, this is, in the center, a uh, uh, screenshot taken from the Arab News, which is the, one of the major uh, English language papers in Saudi Arabia, which is the government's uh, portrayal of how the legal process works. Uh, the last I uh, was able to, uh, to determine, there's about 56 uh, detainees still under uh, detention. Uh, 
the Attorney General tells us that about 2% of those originally investigated and detained uh, were proven through whatever the process is to be innocent, which um, for me uh, is quite gratifying. If you look at the gentleman up in the right-hand corner of this slide, uh, that is Ibrahim al-Assaf, who for many, many years was the kingdom's finance minister. He's well known in the World Bank and, and so forth. Um, he's now a minister of state without portfolio. Uh, and for a number of years, uh, he's been a, a Saudi Aramco director. Um, he is among the 2%, apparently, because uh, in uh, January of this year, after disappearing from uh, the scene for a couple of months, uh, without any fanfare, he reappeared at a Council of Ministers uh, meeting, looking somewhat glum, not surprisingly. Uh, and shortly after that, he was made the uh, kingdom's uh, head of delegation to the World Economic Forum in Davos. So he's at least been rehabilitated. Um, Vision 2030 uh, and its programs and initiatives is the government's vision of the future. Uh, it's uh, admittedly ambitious, yet they think achievable blueprint, which uh, well, expresses long-term goals and expectations, reflects the country's strengths and capabilities. It's designed to prepare Saudi Arabia for a future characterized by much less dependence on oil revenues, an expanded role for the private sector, uh, and a correspondingly diminished role for the government. Built around three themes shown here, creating a vibrant, tolerant, and forward-looking society, developing a thriving, diversified economy, uh, and enabling the aspirations of an ambitious nation and its people. Uh, the first one's probably the most interesting, uh, generally, and from a political and societal point of view, but I'm going to uh, focus on the second in the interest of time, uh, developing a thriving, diversified economy. Um, it's intended to diversify uh, the Saudi economy away from its dependence on oil revenues uh, and public uh, sector employment, uh, as well as government uh, subsidy supports growing the private sector and creating jobs. Implementation programs and initiatives include a national transformation program, a public investment fund restructuring program, uh, which is intended to make the uh, PIF more uh, able and uh, use it as uh, a vehicle to diversify income to the government. Uh, and associated with that, uh, a very wide-ranging privatization plan for most government holdings, including Saudi Aramco, obviously. Um, a strategic partnerships program, which basically is to encourage inward investment and to find a home for uh, Saudi investment overseas. The two partnerships uh, that have been uh, announced to date, uh, one with the United States, and one with the People's Republic of China. Um, and then finally, the Saudi Aramco Strategic Transformation Program, which is recognized as uh, a central part of the Vision 2030 uh, strategic plan. There are a number of very ambitious economic targets, which I wish I could go through. Um, some detail, I'll just uh, put them up here. Um, lowering unemployment from 11.6% to 7%, uh, raising non-oil exports from 60% to 50%, 16% to 50%, um, and so forth. Um, increasing localization of oil and gas procurement, uh, manufacturing 50% of uh, defense products in the kingdom. And you have to understand, Saudi Arabia is the third largest spender on armaments in the world. Uh, 
third only to the United States and the People's Republic of China. It's a reflection of the threats that it sees around it. Um, and as I said, growing uh, the PIF to around $2 trillion by value, uh, largely on the back of the Aramco IPO, and cre increasing uh, foreign direct investment. There have been some successes to date. Um, there's also been a lot of resistance to change. Uh, there's been frustration, I think, within the government over the pace of implementation of the plan. Um, this is likely reflected to a degree in the anti-corruption campaign because many of those that got swept up in it were vocal critics of um, the vision and pressure to accelerate the Aramco IPO process. So uh, the, I, the Saudi Aramco IPO, uh, it's a centerpiece of Vision 2030 um, and the PIF uh, privatization and uh, restructuring, restructuring program. Uh, the government's financial advisors say that it will demand a premium price because of a unique equity story that's kind of summarized here. Um, it's projected to be the largest IPO by value in history. Um, if you assume a value kind of in the mid-range of from the government's $2 trillion to the $1.2 to $1.5 trillion that uh, you hear most often from analysts, um, it would be somewhere between, the proceeds would be somewhere between two and four times that of Alibaba, the largest IPO to date. Um, Saudi Aramco would be valued, if it was valued in, in those uh, numbers, it would be at least twice as big as Apple and four times as big as Exxon Mobil. Um, Headline issues at this point uh, include timing of the IPO, uh, valuation of the company, and where the shares will be listed. The uh, target for launch of the IPO for quite a while has been late 2018. Uh, recent statements from uh, both the Crown Prince as well as the Energy Minister and Saudi Aramco CEO uh, have uh, reconfirmed this. Uh, I think it's achievable, um, at least as things stand today. And the reason for that is that a number of the predicates to listing uh, are largely complete. The company's financial reporting systems have been largely overhauled to make them uh, appropriate for an international listing and to meet uh, listing requirements. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think, uh, reduction of the tax rate from applicable to Saudi Arabia uh, from 85% to 50% in anticipation of the IPO uh, start, was applied from beginning of last year. Saudi Aramco was converted into a Saudi joint stock company under the local company's law uh, just this past month. And um, a draft petroleum law, which the kingdom has never had in the past, and a revised concession agreement uh, uh, have been uh, completed and submitted to the government uh, committee that's responsible for overseeing the IPO for government approval. There's uh, an audit, the first audit in the company's history of its reserves data uh, underway currently, and as I understand it, uh, close to being completed. Um, uh, I'll tell you in just a second. Um, McGraw-Year and Naughton and um, a unit of uh, Baker Hughes. Yeah, Gaffney, Klein, and Associates, which is now part of Baker Hughes. Uh, drafting of the pr prospectus and selection of underwriters are both underway. Uh, the biggest open issue is the listing venue for the shares. Uh, as far as valuation is concerned, as I said, uh, the government would like you to think that uh, Aramco 
is worth more than $2 trillion. Analyst assessments are um, all over the place, uh, between $400 uh, billion and uh, I saw one as high as $4 trillion plus. But I think that um, overvalued the oil in the ground quite significantly. Uh, in valuing the company, you need to look at a number of things. Obviously, it's historical performance, which has never been disclosed publicly and has only been speculated on. Oil prices, which are anybody's guess going forward. Tax and royalty rates, which uh, are set currently. But of course, the government always, as, as the sovereign, always has the right to raise them again at some point in the future. Uh, credibility of the reserve data, which hopefully this uh, uh, audit will uh, put to rest. And then, uh, broadly speaking, an assessment of the political risk of investing in Saudi Arabia. Uh, listing venues, um, the, uh, both the company and the government have been courted by every uh, stock exchange in the world, virtually. New York, London, Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, Tokyo, Toronto, uh, Singapore, et cetera. These, I think, are the, the most likely alternatives, although the government still uh, has not made a decision, at least that it's willing to share. Uh, what it, what's clear is that some of the shares will be listed on the local exchange, something called the Tadawal. Uh, but because of the rather limited liquidity of the Tadawal, uh, there's a need to sell the majority of the shares somewhere else. In New York, in London, and or in Hong Kong or Shanghai, for example. Uh, or to uh, do one or more private placements with uh, sovereign wealth funds, a number of which have expressed interest in investing in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, New York listing is reportedly favored uh, by the financial advisors to the government. Its legal advisors, on the other hand, uh, caution that listing in New York could expose Saudi Aramco and the government's other assets in the United States uh, to U.S. litigation and attachment to satisfy judgments. Um, Nevertheless, the government um, is, I think, leaning toward New York as a listing venue. To give you a, an idea of the geopolitical uh, implications or interest in all of this, um, this is a uh, tweet from um, our president uh, encouraging a uh, U.S. Um, listing. Uh, he also gave a speech in Japan of all places, um, uh, advocating the same thing. Uh, Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, has visited Riyadh twice in the last six months or so to uh, promote a London listing. Uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan has done the same on behalf of the Tokyo Exchange, etc. But uh, from uh, and, and this slide which just very briefly gives you a feeling for the relative uh, liquidity of the various exchanges. You can see why New York uh, is favored from a, a financial point of view for a listing of this magnitude. It's uh, almost five times the size of either London or Hong Kong. Uh, it's more than 50 times the size of the Saudi exchange. Um, as I said, there are concerns over legal exposure. Uh, Aramco has very, uh, been very successful over the years in insulating itself from exposure to U.S. litigation by operating through separately uh, capitalized subsidiaries and not selling oil in the United States, delivering oil outside of the, uh, the boundaries of the, the U.S. Um, you list in the U.S., uh, Saudi Aramco will be exposed to U.S. securities laws uh, and litigation under them. Um, and the government's holdings 
could be um, subject to attachment uh, as a result of uh, the 9-11 lawsuits, which the JASTA legislation, if you've heard anything about that, uh, removed the government's um, sovereign immunity for suits by American uh, citizens impacted by the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack. Um, and I think this is the last slide, you'd be happy to know, but um, political risk generally uh, can be broken down uh, along this, uh, this track. Um, an international uh, investor will ask himself uh, about the implications of investing in a company which will remain 95% owned by a sovereign uh, government. Uh, will the government uh, interfere in the company's management going forward? Will it continue to dictate, uh, impose limits on oil production to manage its relationships within OPEC? Will it continue to require Aramco to invest in from one and a half million to two million barrels of unused generally unused production capacity, which can be brought on, on uh, online within short order if there's a supply disruption, um, again, to, to exercise its swing producer role. Will Saudi Aramco continue to be directed to uh, execute large-scale government um, infrastructure uh, projects of one sort or another? Um, the last few years since 2007, Saudi Aramco has built and staffed one large uh, research uh, university in Saudi Arabia. It's built football stadiums. It's managed the uh, renewal of the Jeddah stormwater system. Lots of things that are good for the country but don't produce uh, income for the shareholders and in any event, take uh, resources away from the company. Uh, changes in the tax and royalty rates, you know, that's fine as far as it goes, but as I said earlier, uh, the government can always raise those rates back uh, to their original levels should it have second thoughts about uh, the wisdom of the IPO. Uh, and then the implications of the anti-corruption uh, purge erosion of faith in the rule of law and investment uh, damage to the investment climate are also uh, something that uh, investors are going to worry about. And then you know, the long-term political stability of a country that's undergoing the sort of uh, deep and broad fundamental change, both uh, socially and economically and politically, that Saudi Arabia is. It's needed change but it's disruptive change. So we'll have to see. David, I wanted to ask you about the issue you raised on reserves. Now, you probably recall this book back 15 years ago, Mirage in the Desert. I'd very much like to hear your perspective on the opacity or, or transparency of what we know about reserves. Well, externally, um, you know very little, and that's been a problem. Um, there have not been any audits of, uh, external audits of the company's reserve data uh, back to the very beginning. There was a recognition when they started talking about an IPO that that had to change uh, because there's enough speculation and noise out there questioning the validity of the 268 billion, dollar, billion barrels of reserves that the company has published year after year after year. And the reason that it remains relatively constant is that it calibrates, it's an investment in the upstream to maintain effectively 265 to 270 billion barrels of proven reserves. So as it produces oil, it replaces that oil um, 
without, uh, so far, without a lot of difficulty because of the uh, plentiful nature of the, uh, of the resource. But uh, now sometime early in this year, I mean, if they're, going to, if they're going to IPO the company before the end of 2018, that information needs to be out there relatively quickly, probably within the first quarter. I'm a lawyer and not a petroleum engineer. Uh, I'm assured by this, the uh, senior vice president uh, for the upstream that uh, the numbers are good. And in fact, they're more conservative than uh, some uh, commercial companies might, uh, might calculate. Yes. Um, what is the role of renewable energy in the Vision 2030 plan? It's significant. Um, the, I think the first element uh, of investment in renewals is a plan by 2023, I think, uh, to install nine gigawatts of uh, solar and wind. Uh, and I think they want to go beyond that. There's a, an institution within the, or under the Ministry of Energy called the King Abdullah uh, City for Atomic and uh, Renewables um, Energy, which KCARE, uh, which is responsible for developing those uh, programs. And in fact, now that I'm in private practice, I'm supporting um, at least one of those. That they do have significant uh, aspirations, both for renewals, uh, renewables and also, interestingly enough, for nuclear energy. Uh, I've already got the mic, I'm sorry. Uh, I was curious to know what, what you think is the rationale behind Saudi Aramco seeking investments from private markets as opposed to, uh, so, sorry, public markets as opposed to private markets. I would imagine that Aramco would not have any problems getting the same amount of investments and proceeds from institutional investors from sovereign wealth funds, as you mentioned. So why, why exactly are they seeking exposure to the public markets? Is it because of the liquidity, or is there some other political um, dynamic behind it? You would have to ask the government, because the government's managing this, not, not the company. Uh, first, there will be shares offered to the Saudi public, uh, because the whole idea of uh, privatizing the goose that's laid lots of golden eggs over the years um, is not something that's easily accepted by a lot, large number of people in Saudi Arabia. So, um, and they don't want to see the national treasure sold off to foreign investors, foreigners, um, notwithstanding uh, whether that's good for the the country as a whole or not. So there will be shares sold on the, the public uh, exchange in Saudi Arabia. Uh, yes, there have been a number of so sovereign wealth funds um, and institutions that have expressed a desire to, to be cornerstone investors in the company uh, on a private placement basis. Um, I read somewhere that uh, Sinopec and PetroChina, in fact, have made it known that, uh, and they're both owned by the, the Chinese government, that they would purchase the full 5% if it was offered to them. So there are kind of geopolitical elements to this uh, as well as, as commercial elements. Uh, I think the government, uh, although they haven't said this, I just suspect that uh, their long-term goal is to make secondary offerings and to, to offer additional shares uh, in the future. And, I, and there's some value to having a publicly uh, traded uh, history for um, valuation purposes. But that's not a good answer, I know. But uh, as I say, it's up to the government and not to, uh, to Saudi Aramco, although the company has its own views. 
I just wanted to ask about Aramco's role during the uh, varied and, and huge uh, geopolitical things that happened, specifically the oil embargo, 1973, when you went there. Um, like, How did they deal with it? 1979, the siege of Mecca and the 80 to 88 war between Iran and Iraq, because I know that was a bit funded by Saudi oil. So how did, they, how did that reflect on the reserves or the revenue? Okay, well, there, there's a number of questions there. Um, I joined the company in September of 1973, about three weeks before the 73 uh, Arab-Israeli war and the oil embargo that, that flowed from it. So uh, within a matter of weeks, I was working for a company that was not only on its road to be sold to a foreign government, but also uh, being uh, instructed by the Saudi government to embargo oil to the, uh, to the United States. Uh, now, I, I'm not, I wouldn't want it to go beyond this room because it's not widely known, but during the embargo, Saudi Arabia, as a, uh, Aramco, was allowed to continue um, supplying the American fleet in the Mediterranean, which it did. And fortunately, the oil embargo didn't last too long. Um, during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, you know, other than um, satisfying production uh, requirements set by the government, uh, the company had no um, role in you know, where oil revenues that flowed to the government went. Uh, certainly none of them went directly to either of the parties involved in the conflict. During the first Gulf War, uh, we were asked to ramp up production and uh, to supply the U.S. and coalition forces in the kingdom, uh, which we did. And uh, you know, under those circumstances, that was quite an achievement. Uh, so a lot of the expatriate employees departed. Um, a lot of the contractor, well, more of the contractor uh, working population departed. So maintaining and ramping up production under those circumstances um, was quite uh, a challenge, but uh, the, the company uh, did it. Thank you for a very enlightening uh, presentation. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I have so many questions, but I don't want to steal anyone's time. So what I want to ask is, um, we've been hearing uh, cyber attacks to Saudi Aramco lately. And um, Iran is accused to be behind of those attacks. So I would like you to comment on that a little bit and like what kind of cybersecurity policies that Aramco follows to counter that. Well, we thought before 2012 that we had quite robust uh, cyber security. And we found to our disappointment that we didn't. Uh, as you obviously know, Aramco in, 2000, in August of 2012 suffered, it, to that point at least, one of the most uh, damaging cyber attacks uh, in history. Um, 35,000 um, hard drives were destroyed by a, a malware um, bug that was introduced into the system. The, the most damaging thing was there was a period of about six weeks before it was discovered where they were, whoever it was, was mining very sensitive uh, data from uh, Aramco, including upstream data and um, militarily significant uh, data. Uh, the company and the government uh, are convinced they know uh, who it was, and it was state-sponsored. And it probably wasn't a single state, but there was one state that was clearly involved. Um, beyond that, I can't uh, say too much. Since then, uh, the company has invested uh, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in hardening its um, cyber security. I mean, one of the simple things that it did to avoid uh, what happened in 2012 in terms of the hardware um, was to um, disable all of the USB ports in all um, computers across the, country, the, uh, the company. Now, fortunately, 
the operating facilities were already disconnected from the internet, um, theoretically, although engineers being engineers, when they find a way to make uh, uh, business a little easier, will find workarounds, which we found a lot of them did. But fortunately, there was no damage done to any of the operating facilities. It's mostly uh, you know, in the, uh, the engineering area, I'm happy to say not in the legal area, um, and uh, some of the business uh, units. Well, thank you very much, David. As I said, if anybody wants to join us, we're going to wander over to Gabriel's at the AT&T Center to have a few drinks and a little something to eat. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us and continue the discussion there. Thank you for your attendance tonight, and please, a round of applause for David. Thank you very much.